going to mug me. I'm not going to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. and it's like uh, another mummy to the kids. A domestic helper for me is we are the one who's been in charge of the house when the boss is not around. <laughs> the person that actually runs the household. The helper is someone who brings the family together. I call her my hot granny. Hot, my hot <laughs> granny. I work, my husband works, so when we're both gone, she's not helping, she's doing. She's always there standing next to me and shouldering the responsibilities with me. She brings me to school, she, she cooks me dinner, breakfast and lunch. They take care of most of the things that, that um, you don't have time to do. They touch all our lives. To me it's like a mother and it's a friend. Part of the fabric of Hong Kong. She does everything but breathe for me. My name is Lisa Avellino. I'm Mabel. I'm Tess. My Dorsino. Narcisa Taneo. Connie Felica. Filma Hundarino. Mudiastri. Reggie. Yumi. Cecilia. I am, I am I'm a domestic helper. Domestic helper. Domestic helper. Domestic helper. Domestic helper, domestic helper. Domestic helper in Hong Kong. Oh, hi Hong Kong Chokung The term domestic uh, helper is misleading, I feel, uh, simply because helper means many different things in many different contexts. To some domestic helpers, helper describes to them what they do. They help people get on with their daily life. To many others, helper has a connotation of subservience and servitude. A helper to me is first and foremost an employee, okay? An employee that I'm very fond of, but an employee who has the same rights that any other employee would have. Hired household help is actually a global phenomenon. And hired household help differs depending on your income, on your nationality, on your place of living. Say for instance you're in America, you have a babysitter. 
And if you're in Europe, you may have a student au pair. Um, in Africa, we have many aunties. So when I arrived to Hong Kong, it was the first time I was confronted with the concept of a foreign domestic helper, who was a live-in and from a neighboring country, but not necessarily part of the family. In those days in Hong Kong, we did not have foreign domestic helpers. So my mom did that, and it was a live-in armor. I'm from Indonesia, the Philippines. I've been working in Hong Kong for 22 years. I've been here for seven years. 18 years. Four years. 20 years. 25 years. 26 years. 25 years? 30, almost 37 years. Because that was March 1979 when I started with them. I came to Hong Kong to earn money for my kids because I am a single mom and I have to raise them by my own. I consider myself a breadwinner in my family. I come here to work and earn for my family. Earn more money for my family. Earn money and to support my family and their needs. Because uh, I'm just a high school graduate there, so it's hard to find work in the Philippines. Because uh, I don't have any work in the Philippines. Because in the Philippines, I have no job. Job in the Philippines is quite difficult to find. In Hong Kong, it's more uh, salary than in our country. Financially, you could have a stable income. It's quite hard, but since I'm here, it's better life now. Because if I'm staying in the Philippines, I cannot do that. Because we don't want them to suffer in the Philippines. I came from the Philippines. I was born in Negros, and then when I was five years old, my family moved to the south, and I grew up in Davao City. It's not easy because my parents are poor, so we don't have a permanent job. But well, there's nothing much you can do about it. You just have to survive. I only managed to reach high school. I just couldn't afford to go to college. I always have this dream that someday I'll go somewhere and make life better. But in, in some sense, what, what, what are you going to do if you stay in one place? There's nothing there for you, so you have to move somewhere. Coming to Hong Kong, it's like three times the payment, so everyone wants to go. So it's my opportunity to come over. I arrive the first day, it's like everything's new. Never been into this very nice city. Uh, everything's just, I see the, I saw the MTR train. And at first, it's the airplane. <laughs> Never been, this is my first time to go on an airplane. Oh, it's amazing. It's a little bit scary being away from family, away from home, speak a, a foreign language. You know, you have to deal with, with strangers, work with a family that's foreign to you, like Westerners. So you don't really know. It's different culture, totally. Would you like to come and help me put some scones to put in the oven? But you be careful, it's hot, okay? Do you want to help as well? Do you want to see? Come to have a look. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, dear. Come on, shake it, shake, shake, shake. Come on, shake it. There you go. Is it good? Okay. I say I'm used to doing the housework, but it's a different the way we do it back home. And it's different from the, the way the Westerners do it. So you have to really do your best follow all the instructions. It's not an easy one the first time because uh, I'm not used to all the gadgets like all the dishwashers, all this uh, washing machine. <laughs> we don't know how to do the manual washing machine and, and then the oven. Everything's new, so new experience. Oh, and then I get used to it. So it's nice by the time I get to earn my first salary. Oh yes, 
money. <laughs> More than I can, you know, I can imagine I, I earn for a whole year. It's just really overwhelming for the first timer and uh, I get excited and I get so motivated to do more. I want to stay in Hong Kong. Well, she's part of the kids' lives. Um, she's been with us since more or less, well, from the first months that we arrived in Hong Kong. I think she, she's obviously very important. Um, you know, when she comes uh, out in the morning, it's hugs and kisses all round and at bedtime, it's hugs and kisses all round. Which one shall we read first? That? Little book of baby animals. What's that? Baby. That is a bee. <laughs> it's a bee. It's very nice. How about that? Our baby's very baby's very first bedtime book. <laughs> My name is Annelin from the Philippines, and I live in Manila. I came to Hong Kong because, you know, I would like to give the best future to my children. In Manila, is, uh, I can work there, yeah, but the problem is salary is very low compared to here. And uh, I think it is better to be, you know, it's, even it's really hard for them to be far with them, but I have to sacrifice. My eldest son, he finished already his education, four years course, hotel and restaurant management. And by next year, early, early next year, my youngest son will finish engineer. And I can say that I am a best and very proud mom with that. You know, because maybe if I didn't come to Hong Kong, I think I couldn't give them the best future and I couldn't send them into the best school. My eldest son, up to now, he couldn't understand why I'm far with them. Because up to now, he's still blaming me. Why? Because he has so many questions. Why there are some families that they can still survive, even they are not far with their children, but I am trying my best to understand him because I would like to give you the best future. But my youngest son is very quiet and he's just trying to tell me that it's okay, Mama, I understand, but don't worry, everything will be fine. So I hope someday. Going back to Hong Kong now, it's hard to say goodbye. To be honest, it's really hard. But as I've said, I, I have no choice, you know. I still need to work. I would like to spend the Christmas with them, with my family, you know, my kids. Because it's been more than 10 years, I think, I don't spend the Christmas with them, yeah, so hopefully. If we didn't have Annalyn, then I wouldn't be able to go to work feeling as confident and relaxed as I do. I probably wouldn't work if we didn't have her. Having Annalyn means that, that me and my husband can work full time and know that our children are safe, being well looked after, loved, cared for while we're at work so we don't have to worry about that. It takes away the anxiety. I'm taking care of the kids, which is not my own children, but I treated them like my own and I think they saw that one. They trusted me so much. Going back to work for me was hard and having to make the sacrifice of going to work and not being able to care for my children myself. Um, so I can't even imagine how hard it must be to have to make the choice to leave the country where you live, where your family and your own children are, 
to have to go to make a living. It's a choice she had to make so that she could give her, her boys a future. But uh, yeah, I don't think it can compare really. Rather than being in one long line, I kind of want you in a clump. Do you know what I mean? Sort of like two, two, and two. Because that way your voices will blend better. OK, so we're going to start off with a warm-up song. It starts off with... Senwa da dendi senwa. Can you try that? Senwa da dendi senwa. Senwa da dendi. Senwa. My name is Ida. Hi, my name is Anneli. My name is Narcisa. Hi, I'm Rosario. Hi, my name is Jean. Hi, I'm Anneli. My name is Vilma Hondarino from Ansang Hero. Hi, I'm Joy and I am one of the Ansang Heroes. I'm Mary Lou from Ansang Heroes. I'm working at the Peak School in Hong Kong and I've been working here for five years as head of music and drama. She's smelly old sock in the rotten apple, rotten apple core. What have we got? A rotten apple core, a moldy all right, let's put that smelly old sock down, shall we? The covers are I've come from a very musical family. My biggest influence is my father, who was a BBC producer and musical director, and he made amazing, wonderful, exhilarating films. And we used to play piano duets together and make up music together, compose together. Well, you've got a smelly old sock, but remember, it starts off with a mouldy piece of cheese. The Unsung Heroes Choir was an idea I had in my mind for quite a long time, and it was kind of sitting there brewing there. I, I run adult choirs and children's choirs, and I had this idea. There's a huge Filipino community here, and a lot of them sing, and they work really hard. I really had a lot of empathy for women who had given up a lot and were struggling. I'm a single parent, and I brought up my children since they were very small on my own. Financially, I've had to make sacrifices to keep a family. I don't think I would have been able to cope as a single mother without the support of a domestic helper, because you don't have family backing out here. Uh, you don't you don't have that support you might get in your own country. So I had to work full-time, I had to work part-time and full-time. So my domestic helper at the time, her name is Gloria, the most wonderful woman on this planet, rescued me, saved me, and I couldn't have done it without the help of a domestic helper. words, the lyrics in my mind, I wish I could kiss you goodnight for a long time, before the, actually before the tune came. And the reason why is because the helpers in Hong Kong are generally putting other people's children to bed and they are not able to kiss their own children goodnight. And as a mother myself, I know that is one of the most precious, tender moments. Even now my children are all grown up, that moment when you put them to bed and you kiss them goodnight, it's just the most precious time and they're not able to do that. I took the song to them and played it to them and I was fiddling around with the iPod trying to make the sound work and then I turned around and looked and they were all crying and I thought this is the song. <laughs> I have 
three children. The youngest one is five years old this coming February, and then 11 and 12. And this is not uh, my plan to go to abroad. But that time, when we separate from uh, with the father of my kids, when they asked me one piece, <laughs> I don't have money. I, I don't have, I didn't give them. Well, uh, and then I say, oh, what's happening to me? Uh, uh, how can I support my three kids? Even one peso I don't have. I don't know well, what's come on my mind. I let them go to school. And then I pack my things. And then I go to Manila. I didn't uh, ask, I didn't tell them that I will go somewhere. Or I, uh, I don't know what's, what's, go, what's come on my mind. Just I send them to the school. And then when they come back from the school, I'm gone. It's a very hard decision because that time, I don't know what to do. Usually, I'm so very guilty for that decision. I'm so selfish. Because when my kids come back from the school, they ask, where's Nanay? Nanay means mother. And then my brother said, uh, she find, uh, I think she, uh, she go to Manila to find a work so that she can, they can support you. For me, it's good decision and bad. Good decision because I can support them now. But the bad thing is, especially my son, now she he is not going to school because she want she want me to go home. She want uh, he want me to take care of them. But I said, can I cannot because I need to work. But until now, I still didn't understand. My, my my decision because they are still young but I said someday you will understand what I need why I need to do this <laughs> People back home think that it's an, a great opportunity for women to go abroad to work as a maid and earning more money. It's a way out from poverty. I have two boys, twins. They live with their father. Yeah, I've been away for too long. Didn't see them often. I think they're just kind of um, getting get used to me not being around. Married life back then for me is kind of hell. There were good moments when I had my boys, but then change when you have to think about what to eat or to get the next kind of milk for them. But he's so proud and he doesn't accept jobs that is not in his expertise and at the time there's none. So they just sit there and smoke and drink and let the time pass by while, the, while we are getting hungry. I can't stop it. It reminds me of my childhood again. And with my mother it's taking care of us. Father is a you know, alcoholic. Every night there is always an argument. And I told myself I will not have that kind of life. Kids were then two years old and I had the chance to come to Hong Kong and I left thinking about you know probably life will be better for everyone I think I came back only once the first year never made it back after that it's hard to completely out of touch it's like I say I abandoned them that's the big mistake probably that I have ever made in my life I'm Nurul Hidayah. I'm from Indonesia. I have been in Hong Kong like seven years working. My family is uh, quite big. Three brothers and um, two sisters. I'm looking for money for my family. So many of my relatives, my neighbors, they come to Hong Kong. They can build a house. 
they can have an easy life. The first employer, I just stay there like uh, one year. I look after the kids like uh, two years. Then they said I cannot cooking. I have to try and try, but they cannot. They cannot wait for that, so they just terminate me. My second employer is uh, from Germany and in the Indonesia. The woman is from Indonesia. I'm looking for two kids. One is was uh, only two weeks when I come there, and the second one was uh, three years or three years or two years something like that. Then I stay there like uh, 22 months, almost finish a contract. Then I was just having a case with them. They call the police to come to my place. They arrest me because they say I'm stealing something from them. So I living there in my friend place until I get this baby with my boyfriend. Once a domestic migrant worker becomes pregnant, all too often um, she is fired from her employment. And because domestic workers are required to live in the employer's home, what then happens is that her whole security net breaks. They bring me to police station because my employer is look like, I don't want you anymore, you know. After 30 minutes having an interrogate in a police station, then I go to agency place. They're not even asking me to extend my visa. Within two weeks of the end of her employment, she's denied all access to social um, and public health and welfare protection. More often than not, a loan shark, the agency, or indeed sometimes the employer, will be holding on to her identity papers. She literally and physically is unable to leave Hong Kong. So, as for anyone who's in a desperate situation, the, the falling into the worst levels of precarity happens very quickly. The time I already pregnant eight, eight months. Before the last got, I go to consulate. After consulate, they give me a travel document. Maybe after finish this court, maybe I go back to Indonesia. That's what I wish to always. Then I go to immigration. The immigration tell me that I already overstay over one year. So I'm asking them to give back my ID, my passport, please just give back because I have this kind of case that they don't want to accept. not find the guilty. It was wasting very long time for me. If I'm working, maybe I already can build a house. I was a teacher before, but my salary is not enough. A bachelor of Science in Commerce, major man management, and was working in a bank. My parents took care of my son since my for his first year. And I was in the airplane for his first birthday. When I left her, he's only a three years old. So after one year here in Hong Kong, I I have a chance to to see my kids. And then my youngest daughter didn't recognize me. Uh, my message to my children. <laughs> Relates the song that we are singing for them, the Anton Heroes. I wish I could kiss them with that every night. Very thankful because I can relate my life with my with the song. I said important message to my son just to be study hard and don't forget to love me. I had no idea that the video would be so well received or that so many opportunities would come. And now the unsung heroes have been invited to perform a clock and flap. 
we're super excited to have the unsung heroes on stage at Clock and Flap. So for Clock and Flap, what we are at our core is a platform. So we want to be showcasing creativity, culture, art, um, and especially those things that resonate locally. And I think kind of the, the, the timing, the context, everything about the message is very relevant to Hong Kong right now. I am unbelievably excited for the unsung heroes to play Clock and Flap. My grown-up kids are like, Mom, sing Clock and Flap. Clock and Flap is a three-day music and arts festival held in Hong Kong. Um, it's a very silly name for what ultimately is a very silly festival. Um, but the whole idea being to bring together a sum of all the parts. This is it, so improvised. Do you want that first, or do you want to just take it on with the microphone? You know, you just pick up the microphone. I got something to say, and I go. Mm, I got something to say. I got something to say. I got something to say. Something to say. I'm gonna going to fill the sky with our voices. I was wondering what to do there, so I'm gonna fill. That was gorgeous. Voice on the same course, and then you gotta, you gotta find. Voice. Come on, go sing with me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Yeah, okay, that's so that's the yeah. intro. And then this is where you lead it and the choir come in. So it's. My name is Joy. I'm from Philippines and I've been here for like nine years. I come from a musical family. My father's side, they are all musical. So my father is playing harmonica. My other other relatives they are playing also. They are singing, so they they're like we, we are like um, we love music. I still remember when there was no electricity, nothing to do. My father would get his harmonica, I'll get my guitar, and my other sisters would sing. It was really fun. I took a bachelor of science in elementary education, and I really enjoyed it. During my college years, I also joined choir and joined competitions. After graduation, I became a public school teacher for four years. My life in Hong Kong and my life in the Philippines was totally different. My life as a domestic helper was, at first, really hard. Because way back to Philippines, I don't know that much how to iron. So when I get here, some other duties were first time for me. So I need to learn how to look after my employers, furry family members, how to keep the house, and how to look after the children. I still remember my employer heard me singing with my ward, um, with her daughter. And she surprised me for a birthday gift. It's a music session with vocal coach. So when I went to the vocal coach and she said, OK, so I think you're ready to have a show. So she was singing with just someone that was playing an acoustic guitar. He said, you've got to come and hear this girl sing. Drop jaw moment for all of us, really. So, yeah, we asked her if she'd be interested to play in the band, and, uh, and it's been fantastic. When I was young, I dreamed a lot of things like to be an international singer. I would like to go abroad. I dreamed to have a big concert. When years go by, I think. I pursue some of those. I became a teacher, yes, but I would like to go abroad, and that's why I moved to Hong Kong. And I dream also to, to perform as an artist, to, to perform as, an, as a singer. Because of this exposure, Jane 
knew me, and she she sent me a message. Uh, she would like to she would like me to join the, the choir. And for me, every every musical invitation is an opportunity. So why not? I said, okay, I'm in because this is what I love to do. It's the first destination for the new arrival to stay at the stage square. Automatically, you have to go there because you don't know anyone. You know, there's lots of Filipinos there, so you feel at home. So I, I did that for the first few months. And it's, it's manic on Sunday. Just there's no, no place to sit down. You end up sitting on the floor. When you get tired of sitting down, you just feel like you wanted to lie down. So you just get a cardboard box and lie down there. I managed to stand back and look at everyone's doing and people like foreigners taking photos. I'm not comfortable. So my first employer advised me that, she said, I know there's nowhere for you to go on Sundays, but well, don't, don't misinterpret what I'm telling you. I don't want you to sit there because for me, it's degrading. Like go somewhere else, find something, something else. So she helped me Google any hiking group in Hong Kong and the first one we found is the Hong Kong Trampers. The first hike I did with them is Pak Tin Leng in Taipo. I was struggling at first, but the group really very helpful. They waited for me until they said to oh, keep going, there's lots of steps, keep going. They look after me and I'm so grateful. From then on, I'm just attached to the group around like two years then I know most of the trail. So they said, we have a good memory of the trail and you can make conversation with anyone. So would you like to lead a hike? We will support you. Oh, another big boss of confidence for me. And it's just amazing to, to realize that you can actually do more than just washing dishes and <laughs> cooking dinner. <laughs> stories of them um, heavily in debt, uh, under a lot of pressure, and the employment agencies in their own country, and some here in Hong Kong, are not acting properly. I have spent, spent more than 100,000 pesos in the Philippines. That's in 1997. Because they said it's for agency fee. So we must pay the money. So so that we can come here to work. Before I come here, I pay first on the agency there back in Philippines. And after that, I still have the remaining balance here, so I pay back onto the agency every month. I pay even 35,000 altogether, Philippine money. Almost uh, 60,000 peso. Peso, Philippine peso. Uh, in Hong Kong, that is already three months salary. We found that 90% of domestic workers have some level of debt, and that is one of the biggest pressures. They're prone to get approached by illegal practices and loans, and also huge employment agency fees that can take a long time to pay off, and that can set a cycle of indebtedness. That's a huge issue facing domestic workers. It's very common that everyone has to be the breadwinner of the family, so you have to send the money back home. It's, it's required. So I have to send them whatever I have and to, to provide for, for them. I noticed that when you help people, like back home, everyone, you help them, whatever they want to ask for you, you give it to them. It doesn't, it doesn't help them. It's not totally helping them to have a spine, to be responsible. I met the founder of Enrich in 2006. Actually, I've been hiking by then, so I met her on the trail. Enrich is a local Hong Kong charity that provides financial education and empowerment programs for domestic workers in Hong Kong. We are like just uh, want to encourage them to, uh, to learn more about this financial basic education 
and so that they can like uh, manage their salary, their own money. Finance is very tied with life, you know, and emotional relationships and things like that. So learning to prioritize and plan ahead and to assess what's important and what they want to achieve later. And which will like make them realize what is their goals. And then after that, how to make these goals come true, saving for the emergency, for their uh, retirement, so that when anything happened to you, then yes, you're ready, you're financially ready. So I attended the first uh, program. I learned how to do the budgeting and being confident to say no and to have the, um, the will to really stand up. What, what is it? Because you're the one who's earning the money. You are the boss, not the rest, uh, not anyone else. I used to sleep in a in a beach, in a Gold Coast, Tun Moon Gold Coast. For place to stay, maybe I need to pay or whatever. You know, by that time, I just feel like I'm pregnancy, and I don't know who will supporting me. So I that I having a small money, and I just go into this place. Maybe I will be feel okay because I see 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 water. I'm staying there for one month. I don't know what to do. Why is you have to keep this baby and whatever? You're supposed to just throw and then we will we'll be free again and go back to Indonesia. Even you bring this baby, maybe later when you go to Indonesia, we'll be having a, you'll never be talking about you. Your family will not accept you. In the beach, I used to not sleeping very early sleeping like a four or five o'clock in the morning because I keep being playing with the water. In the morning, when there are some people coming for swimming, that is an old, old lady, old man, they come and screaming like, ah. then I just wake up. Then I just feel shy, maybe I don't want somebody to ask me so many questions. It was really an assistance to meet um, the route. I was on the beach joining uh, Indonesian Chinese pastors event that she has a um, Sunday event in the, on a beach like picnic and some of the church mates are partners clients and Nuru, I think she walked by and saw a lot of Indonesians there and some of them have children. So she approached the Indonesians and people see, oh, she was pregnant. And then they wonder what help she had. And she said, nothing. And Jessica asking me, I was like a shy, I was like a hiding myself. I said, I'm okay, yes, my, my boyfriend is there. Every day, yes, of course I have a place, whatever. No, 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 if you're having a, having a problem, just tell me. Then after that, I just called Jessica. I also um, invited her to move to our shelter because we find that she was living in a place that may be not very safe and she has no money after she was terminated her contract. So she doesn't have money for food or anything. So every money that is given from other people. So I think it makes her more vulnerable. For everything from food to water to um, blankets and clothing, particularly in the winter when it's really quite cold here for most Southeast Asian migrants by comparison. Weather-wise, these women are sleeping on the streets and in parks. They are then mixing with the underground um, and most frightening elements of Hong Kong society. And then we see involvement in drugs and prostitution and sex work to, to earn money so they can feed themselves. And then the most horrible thing is that they are then giving birth in, um, in the parks and in the um, public areas of Hong Kong because they have nowhere else to go. One of our clients was in Chongqing Mansion and was asked by a man there who pointed at her swollen belly and said, 
do you want that one? To which she re replied, yes, I do. And he said, well, if you change your mind, the starting price is US dollars 30,000. We focus on ensuring that the most vulnerable children in Hong Kong and their migrant mothers are both respected and protected. And in its broader sense, we ensure that every child we come across has a fair start in life. Pakistan is nice. Having a nice place, big place, friendly, really familiar for me. Yeah, helping me. Like I didn't prepare for my baby clothes, even my clothes for pregnancy, whatever. They just support me for that, everything. We also run uh, many classes here. We have a um, clinic uh, for prenatal and postnatal and newborn baby. We have a um, trained midwife that can provide like breastfeeding, newborn care, they bring me to clinic to check for the pregnancy, the baby inside, the heartbeat. That's your heart together. Perfect. I was living in a shelter, so I just waiting until I feel like I'm, a, I'm about to labor. And about to labor really, and then like at 11.30 in the night. I call ambulance, ambulance come, then my baby, I give birth, let's say, like 12.52 in the night. Sure, you know, the breeze of the air is very nice. We gather here every Sunday, whether we have parties or not. <laughs> you know, seeing my friends and, you know, extra, extra activities is, you know, make us happy. And forget about the problems sometimes at home, sometimes in the work. <laughs> The first time I went to the practice that was held in uh, Central, and I was crying when I, I read their music, the lyrics. A lot of my friends took the picture that I was crying, and then they say they will ask the, oh, what happened to Adinar Zing? They, what happened? Why did she cry? I could not really, you know, control myself because the lyrics really, really uh, touch, you know, being a mother away to the children is really, really touching your life. Every time I sing that song, I always cry. <laughs> because I miss my kids. That's the way how I feel, how, how, how I express my feelings. Though uh, when, we, when I'm singing that song, uh, I think I'm wishing on a star to kiss them good night <laughs> every night <laughs> we saw our face in in facebook we are happy but deep inside uh, we have been <laughs> we are <laughs> We express our feelings when we are singing that song, and then so that uh, everybody will, if they hear that song, and oh, uh, even they are enjoying themselves, they remember, uh, they remember their kids, they are remembering their loved ones. <laughs> Gonna finish the 
concert at Clock and Flat with a new song. It's based on a, hello, Nip. Based on a gospel structure. Find your voice. Find your voice. Find your voice. Find your voice. Sing your song. Sing your song. Sing your song. Sing your song. Bye bye. Section three. Find your voice. Find your voice. It's not that low. It's not. It really is only an A. It's only an A. It's not that low. Wait, I make it sound low because I've got gravelly voice. Find your voice. And again. Find your voice. Find your voice. Right, let's do it all together. Find One, two, three, four. Find your voice. Yay! I joined the Unsung Heroes just because to, to spend my holiday to release our stress. Find your voice. Is that you found <laughs> Boys. <laughs> Boys? <laughs> yeah, good guess, but not quite. We get another chance. I joined the choir last year, the Unsung Heroes, to show in Hong Kong, Hong Kong people, that uh, only domestic helper can do some other stuff. Not only cleaning houses, cleaning bathroom, cleaning toilets, and everything like that. But we've got talents, and we are educated. To reach also those those people that sometimes they really don't understand our situations. One thing that I learned from here is the discrimination, the race discrimination about us because we are domestic helpers. The hardest thing for the uh, domestic helper to come in Hong Kong is the communication, and I. I think some of the treatment of the employer to the employer, to the domestic helpers. It depends on the employer. There are some who are lucky ones. There are some unlucky. They get mistreated. They don't have voices to argue or they just really uh, are very, really mistreated. There are some of them, they just have half of their salary of they are being paid. They don't have day off. We doesn't need to be treated like your own family, but uh, treated you as a human being would be very nice. Sing your song. You got something to say. Well, sing, sing away. It was evident from the start that Lisa was uh, an active person in, in mind and body. I mean, you know, she, um, she was wanting to do things that I guess a lot of helpers don't do. The first travel that I've done was uh, I went to Kanchanaburi in Thailand. My boss gave me the plane ticket. That, that, that brings out the adventurous in me, like very strong personality that I didn't realize before. From then on, I look for places where easy visa for a Filipino passport holder in Southeast Asia. So I did Indonesia, Vietnam, and then I realized I wanted to go higher. I've always been attracted by the Himalayas. If you go to Himalayas, you have to walk on snow. But before going to Himalayas to spend so much money, you need to experience the snow and then end up in Japan. I applied for a visa. They gave me a hard time. She had to go to the Japanese embassy, embassy goodness knows how many times, because they just had never issued a visa to um, Filipino help before. Mm -hmm. After two weeks, they called me. Lisa came over to the office. And then when I went to the consulate, they had me a passport with a single entry. Ah, ecstatic, I cried. <laughs> I just followed the, the Japanese climbers. They're so used to walking on snow, so they're fast. I'm supposed to walk it like 12 hours. It becomes 15 hours, and then I made it up. For me, it's not good enough. I said, I want to go higher. I told my boss, I'm going to Nepal. I said, I'm going to Everest Space Camp. Highland Peak is one of, is a highly sought after Himalayan peak, but you know, not many people, you know, 
have their minds set on something like that so much. I remember her wanting to do this peak. There was something that flew her to it. It cost 3,500 US dollars for the whole 15 days trip, not including the not including my gears and everything. So I have to I have to save the amount, like two years of my salary. It's a massive challenge for anybody. And it's definitely a massive challenge coming from somewhere where people don't see snow. The climb was okay at first, before we reached the base camp. The climb is kind of tiring, and I was struggling by the time I get there. My legs doesn't want to walk on the steps, but I have to. Confidence is a big issue for a lot of people. Mentally, I could see her deteriorating. I sweat from walking, and then suddenly there's a snowstorm. I, I put the thick jacket on without realizing that my top inside, the base layer I'm wearing, is not drying, so it stays cold. I was shivering all the time. I remember she was shivering, had to get into the tent, change her gear. And I think she was realizing at that point that, you know, maybe she's out of her comfort zone. They put all their jackets in me because I was shivering so hard. I just kind of thought I'm going to die. My nose is so congested and you need to breathe properly to climb up the, the crevasse, to climb up the, the ice wall. She knew what was ahead. I've been talking about the glacier and steep angle climbing. And they said, sorry, Elisa, you can't do it. You can't come with us. And I cried. Because you, you're going to be endangering yourself and your teammates. After all of this effort I did, I can't climb. Oh, it's, I was crying for like 20 minutes. Oh, I cried my head off. Sorry. Unfortunately, she has another court hearing now. It is because she gave birth in a public hospital while she doesn't have a visa. So she is currently charged around 100,000 Hong Kong dollars bill for that baby delivery. 100,000 Hong Kong dollars. After one year, exactly, having a big letter, coming then asking me to go to high court for that and I have to pay the bill 100 and something thousand Hong Kong dollar. We're trying to go to hospital to please them to give us this kind of uh, welfare because I really don't have money with me, zero, we don't have any job to do with this kind of status. We also have access to justice program. We have um, really a contact with many uh, pro bono lawyers to fight for their rights. When Neural Host came to see me here at the law firm, um, she actually she was a bit unusual. She wasn't the typical um, client from Pathfinders because her legal issues didn't relate specifically to the pregnancy. It was actually one of these issues that is like a knock-on effect. She had been sued by the hospital authority to recover um, hospital fees because when she ended up actually having her child, she was considered as a non-eligible person. And so she was charged at a much higher rate that the hospital authority charges for non-eligible persons. And when she was unable to pay those fees because they were excessive, I mean, it would be difficult for most people to pay the fees. She was sued to recover the fees by the hospital authority. Give me your teddy bear, please. No, 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 no. So we are dealing with this. A district court hearing is pending for us to to fight for a medical fee waiver for her. It's difficult to watch somebody sit in this kind of form of stasis where they feel just completely disempowered and they can't see anything beyond their current situation. To think that they have a future, I think sometimes they find 
a bit difficult to conceive of that. It's our last rehearsal, so it's really vital that everything is coming together, and hopefully it is. There's just so many loose ends to tie up, and so that's the focus this week. We have managed to get them, I think, into their final lines, um, bearing in mind the space we're going to work in and putting them all in there. We've done our exits and entrances. We've done the bows. So I'll just show. Yes, that's light. I like that. Worked out who hasn't got a T-shirt, who's not been here, kind of all the admin stuff. So I'm just, just getting that sorted. It's important because it just will give you the edge, the professionalism, because the way you walk on, the way you walk off, the way you present yourself, how tight you are as a group really sets the scene. As soon as you walk in, people are going to go, oh, they know what they're doing. I think they've picked up the importance now. I think they've got the vibe. But I think now, it being so close, just a week now, and this is our last rehearsal, I think they've got it. I think I, I can almost feel the buzz amongst them. Uh, I'm so excited and a bit nervous. This is my first time. That's why I felt nervous. I am absolutely excited. <laughs> Just super, super excited about our performance on Clock and Flop. I am too excited in performing Clock and Flop next Sunday. I think uh, the group is uh, dancing here is are, are quite ready. Yes, of course I'm excited. Yes, of course I'm thrilled. I know that. What am I feeling? Scared. I always have this thing about when I fail, is that as long as I'm alive, I'm not dead, there's always hope. I started now thinking if I work another contract, probably I can save again. And, um, okay, I think that's doable. So that cheers me up a bit and I realize I'm still alive. Of course, you can climb up again and I don't want to endanger my, my teammates. When we came home from the Himalayas, last year and um, I started formulating a program for her. She understood that she was going to have to carry a backpack with five kilos because there's going to be 50% less oxygen going to her body. She had to double the weight in her training so she was building up month after month. Every part of her had to be a lot stronger uh, to be able to cope with you know, the pressure of climbing at high altitude. every morning, every workout, just makes you sweat, fuck it. <laughs> I've been to uh, Bikini Fit since, um, it's like six weeks now. Yeah, so big difference. <laughs> I struggle to walk forward with that. <laughs> Let's see, hopefully so I, can, I can do the summit this time. I'm just, I'm just amazed at what you, like, how you're putting all this in to, you know, to do something like that. One of my favorite sayings is like, if you fall down seven, you get up eight, eight times. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe yeah, in that. Yeah. Absolutely. So just had to, yeah. It's a learning, uh, it's a learning process, I think, to, oh, it's just expensive though for me. I have to do it. We need it, sweet girl. I don't need it. I'm just going uh, hiking all day, so I don't have time to do this. But then I have to train 
to strengthen my core and I took the body weight workout and then the yoga and then realized I can incorporate Taekwondo classes with my routine. I like that kind of empowerment that it gives you. Like I always wanted to travel and I'm thinking I'm going to do it alone. So I want to go to places that I've never been before. So to, to know how you can um, like defend yourself in case there's trouble or something like, you know, it's, it's good to know that you, you can be uh, confident. I will do ev everything, anything to get me to the summit. We've seen it on Everest where guides you know, should have turned people around and ultimately um, people lost their lives. But I mean, the reality of it is, is that if I have to turn her around, it could be devastating for her. And I have to make the best decision for her, for myself, for everyone around us. That's something I hope I don't have to do, but if I have to turn around, I absolutely will turn around. Although on a personal level, you know, these things can be crushing. Um, and I, <laughs> let's just see how that one plays out. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident that she's going to come prepared and I'm confident she's going to, she understands what's required. And uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. Good luck. We'll be watching from afar. <laughs> Take it easy, be safe. I will. See you soon. Bye. It's a big opportunity for all of us. It's a huge opportunity yeah. for you all. And yeah. such yeah. a yeah. once in a lifetime, yeah. yeah so once in a lifetime. It, it seems like sometimes we are thinking, oh, is this a dream? But here we are. This is, you know, the finale now. Here we go. Yeah. And then it's a uh, And my boss gave me, you know, even the kids. They hugged me last night and then, okay, we have to wish all the best for Adeline for her performance and like that. I think for us it's very minimal thing to offer the free makeup service to be a volunteer. But this minimal thing can also make all the hard work they will feel very enjoyed and very happy and memorable in their life. I'm not so beautiful. Even I didn't see on a mirror, but I feel it. This is so surprised me. From my, the BPI teacher, she gave me a letter <laughs> to the one of the Asung Heroes member, Aka Jane. Good morning, are you feeling nervous? Hope you're asleep tight last night. If you're feeling nervous, don't be, because I'm sure you're gonna have fabulous performance tonight, and I can't wait to see it live. Lou's been amazing. She's, I mean, in any other scenario, uh, she would have been the C CEO of a, of a major company. She has run this choir, she's done the uh, register, she's kept, she's done all the admin for it. It's like Hong Kong's next top models. <laughs> Having a total makeover. <laughs> How many hours we're going to the showdown, the biggest music festival in Hong Kong, Block and Pop. Amazing. And thank you so thank you much. So much. Yeah. I, never knew. Yeah. Yeah. I can't yeah. believe it. It's me. I can't believe 
you have been working hard, you've been giving up your Sundays, and we've been working musically really, really hard. So at this stage now, we need to get back to what this is all about. Make that song come alive. For people out there in the audience, from the moment you open your mouth, you've got to get them. And you can do that if we work and we connect together. Our job is to make them cry. <laughs> all right? And we will. And, and if we can just get that audience to see you as real people with real stories and not domestic helpers because that's not who you are. That's not who you're born to be. You are real, gorgeous, wonderful women, wives, mothers, a lot of it. And, and here's your chance. Nothing more we can do now. We just have to give the performance of a lifetime. So with your thumbs, it's a little bit ticklish on the foot sometimes, so just remember that if they are if it's ticklish, try to do it a little bit more firm. For my baby and me, like a shalom shika right now. I have no job. I just stay every day with my baby here. It's not boring for me, because I have her. No matter how sad. The rent is very expensive. Then, IS is only supporting me 2250 for my baby and me. So still not enough. I still have to pay my rent. Sometimes I have to change that uh, milk powder with the money. They need the milk for the baby. That's what I do to cover it all this every month. Because it's no support for me and my baby. My family, they are really asking me to just go home, go home. We miss you a long time. No matter what the neighbors say, no matter what they say, just leave it. Maybe it's only two weeks, one week, one month after then, they just forget about it. But I, I just try to prepare myself to handle all this kind. Because in Hong Kong, for working, go back without money, with a baby, carrying a baby. I still need the feeding them, feeding my baby. My baby is not that kind of easy, that's what I'm thinking until now, yeah. I wish I could meet her earlier, before she lost her visa, so she can have an opportunity to earn money to continue supporting her family. But I was too late to know her. So I, I think immigration may be able to resume her visa if we met her within one year. She expired her visa. And I wish I could uh, also connect her, provide her more um, proper legal advice so she can um, do it better. So, and of course, if possible, I would like to help her further to develop a um, path in returning home. I hope she has another way. Because for me, it seems like when she returned home, she has very little opportunity, job opportunity in her home country. She may have to move on to another country to work as domestic helper, leave her job. Yeah, again, it's not easy. For me, I wanted to go to another country. Whatever is that, I have to go with her. But I can live with her always together, you know.
arrive at the world's most dangerous airport in Lukla very early in the morning and then at 9 a.m. we started trekking to the first village. I'm back to do it again. From there, we stayed for one night in Monjo, that's the first uh, village. We hiked for seven to eight days to get to Everest Space Camp. It takes your breath away looking at the big mountains. The altitude amplifies all your physical problems, all your insecurities. If you're not really mentally prepared, for me, I think I'm fine at that point. But when you think, you know, um, I'm tired, I'm not feeling well, I think I, I have a headache, that kind of thing. If you feed into it, your mind, that's where altitude just find ways to get you down. I feel less fatigue compared to last year. I think I my training in Hong Kong, um, the carrying heavy backpacks, pays off. The scenery, when you're standing at every space camp, you get to see you're surrounded by big mountains, giant mountains, like looking at the the top of the world, it makes you feel small. I'm humbled. We did the training, rope training this morning and this afternoon, and it felt good. Well, I have the right gear, and uh, my fitness is more, you know, better this year than last year. It took me a long time to get here. A few years, many years. Never give up. I want to go to the top. The morning of the summit ascent, the big day. It's not morning for me, like it's still dark. <laughs> it's very dark. Also, you have to put our um, headlamps and off we go, tackling the boulders and big rocks. I didn't expect that it's going to be that hard. I'm thinking of the, the rocks, I'm thinking about my breathing, and then suddenly I, I stop breathing and I, I'm just kind of gasping for air. Ian Taylor was behind me and kept telling me, like, breathe. You have to breathe. I'm telling you that for two years. I don't know, maybe I'm scared because I look on my right side, there's a big drop. There's some point along the way that I said, I think this is it, um, I'm going to stop. Can I stop here? And uh, the voice behind me say, no, you can't, keep going. I made it to the top and they said, oh, this is Crampon Point. Oh my Lord, <laughs> this is it. And I hear Ian said, look up, look up, you've arrived. Like, you know, at Crampon Point, enjoy the view, take it in. Standing on top, almost on top of the world, it's a dream come true. First domestic helper to make it to that height. I think it's a great achievement. My boys, I heard from friends that yeah, they're proud of me. I hope I will be reunited with the boys in the future. But I think for what I've achieved right now, they're really happy. They just stay, keep going. And sometimes you don't have to make it to the top to make it an achievement. You just, you know, it's not the mountain that you compared by yourself.
we are here at the Clapping Club Music Festival in Hong Kong. Right now, actually, I called him up and said to tune in into YouTube. We're live, and then we're going to sing at around 6.45. So hopefully, they're going to see me there, and um, I bet we're going to be very excited, and maybe the whole town will <laughs> know about it. <laughs> yeah, I will be the top of the town, maybe. <laughs> We can sing this song to our employer's children, thinking that we are singing this to our parents. Thinking that now we're singing this to your children, actually the message is for our family. The, the love of our family, we, we give this love also to the employers that we have now. I think we always intended for the audience, if, if, if they could just take away one thing, it's the message that these girls are uh, real people. They're not maids, they're not servants, they're not just Filipinos. They are real people with real stories, with something to share. I think it's gonna be a great show. We practice really hard. foreign workers in Hong Kong. I was so grateful to these women who had made this enormous sacrifice and left their children behind and they were helping me looking after my children. What my hope for them is that their voices can be heard and that they can tell their stories. It's really, the lyric is really for us, for our kids in the Philippines. Yeah. To be away from him when he was young. It always hurts me. I ask God someday I'll be with them. My 
my sister called me that I need to do, I need to call at home. In, when I called my sister in the Philippines, I didn't know. I, that's why I know what's happening to my daughter. It's hurt because you're so far from them. That I'm still beneath you. Five years old, a happy girl, uh, a talkative uh, little girl, and I didn't expect that it would happen to her. It's hard that you are so far from your kids. When my sister uh, tell me about what happened to her, I don't know what to do. I just asked my employer, I, I want to go back home, she need me. It's hard that you are, your mother is not there and then uh, I just called it a broken family. Sometimes I want to blame myself. Maybe if I will not go to the so far from them, it's not what it's not going to happen. The last time that I came home is uh, last July for one month. Hello, Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Stop. I built this house actually with my own expenses. And I work hard for it because I really would like to give the best home for my children. The reason why I came home is just to attend the graduation of my youngest son. And uh, I only spend a few days in here, so I would like to spend the rest, you know, to spend much of the time with them. Yeah, oh. <laughs> every time I need her, and when every time I need advice, she's not around or she's not here. For almost two decades, uh, I feel like my mother was not here. 
I always I always wanted uh, to feel her care her care uh, for us. Iba kahit pa paano, iba ko ya. Uh, lahat ng sacrifice ni mama bayad na. Iba. Hindi <laughs> ka kalo ulit doon? Hindi ko na kayo eh. <laughs> Walang iba na itinda naman namin yun. Kunting taste na lang. My father was always uh, always strong. He is also uh, jobless. My mom should be here so that uh, I will feel secure. I always think that uh, what she will gonna do here for us, she do it uh, in Hong Kong. I wish my mom was around when the time I went to school, when parents meeting, she's not around. And Christmas and New Year, she's not around also. I remember was the first time that was uh, my mom was here. Uh, it's my first birthday. That's the only day, that's the only year that my mother was here. Two, three, two until 23, she uh, was not here. Of course, I am very excited because finally, uh, all my success is, you know, uh, paid already. My mom sacrifices in Hong Kong just to be able to get a better future for us. Watching my son during his graduation is really very, very happy and I can't express the feelings being a mom because, you know, finally he's there now and then he's facing into his, uh, you know, next chapter of his life. I'm so happy and proud mom. <laughs> My plans in, in future is to give back, give, uh, given to us by our parents for their sacrifices. If ever he would like to work abroad, not only him, even you know my eldest son, Lyndon. If ever, of course, for me, as much as possible, I don't want them because being apart, especially it's really hard. It's really hard to work abroad. All sacrifices you have to give. Hope sick is always in there. Okay.
domestic helpers, they touch all our lives. They touch the lives of many people living in Asia and elsewhere. I think they are the literally unsung heroes of Hong Kong. Just like people say mothers are the glue that hold the family together, I think in many respects helpers are also part of that glue. We should thank them and if they face problems, we should try to help to solve those problems. 
gonna see me again Now listen I'm gonna stand up And face it on my own so Thank you Virgie for working at the house for such a long time Bing from Peter, from me, from Max, Theo and Wolf And our vast extended family Thanks a million Chaz, thank you so much for everything that you do for our family. And I, I couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, for looking after me so well. Anna Lynn, thank you so much for coming and working with our family. We all absolutely love you. Mary Jane, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Kiala family. Kalita, thank you so much for looking after us. I'm so happy to know you. Thanks, Visa, for everything you've contributed to our little family over the long, long period of time that we've been together. Thank you, Lisa, for your determination, humanity, and your organizational skills. Thank you, Maylin. Maylin, uh, you've been five years with me, and I can never uh, survive in Hong Kong all without you. Terry, thank you so much because every day you make it possible for me to be a good mom. Thank you, Sri, for being so helpful and um, being so kind and so nice to our family. Thank you, Jazz, for everything that you've done for our family. Thank you very much, Tita. Uh, I've been, it's been grateful to have you to be part of my family. Thank you for everything that you do for me. Thank you for the strength you've given me. Surprisingly, makes me feel emotional because <laughs> you don't actually you don't actually take the time to say thank you. Actually, I find very often. Yeah, sorry. And frustration, tell the ticket boy, and hear what I.